Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I think we might get started. Firstly, uh, my name is Terry Slevin. My paid job is as Director of Education and Research at the Cancer Council Western Australia. I'm delighted to be here this afternoon. I'm even more delighted that you are. I'm getting a sense of some very tired souls in the building. The last session I was in, I don't think we got any questions to start with, uh, and I can understand why. It's been a very busy and demanding week, and uh, so I'm very appreciative of you turning up this afternoon to what we think is a very important discussion and debate. So uh, here we're essentially to talk about the issue of cancer societies must invest more resources to reduce the impact of occupational and environmental cancer. Now, there's a fundamental notion that occurs to me when I think about this proposition, and I've been working in cancer society for 23 years. My observation is that across the world, our life expectancy is increasing. So regardless of where we're coming from, we're living longer now than we did 15 or 20 years ago. Also, in many countries, we're expected to stay in the workforce for longer. So the prospect of more people being diagnosed with, with cancer while they're at work is increasing and will continue to do so. My observation is that that's increasingly creating questions for us, whether, and people want to know what caused their cancer. Was it the work that they do? Was it the environment in which they live? and those questions are coming to cancer societies. So that's what's generating concern about this issue. And the question is, do cancer societies need to have better answers to those questions? Should we invest resources to allow ourselves to address that issue? Because the people we serve have a belief, rightly or wrongly, that either their environment or their, or their work is contributing to their cancer. So I believe it's an issue we need to discuss. The format of the debate, as is per the last two debates, and that is, firstly, you're invited to vote on the proposition before the debate commences, and so I encourage you to find the relevant part of the UICC app and cast your vote now, if you would. And we will have the opportunity to see your votes come up on the screen as you do so. So if I can encourage you to find your app, and if I can encourage Todd to stop showing his cycling data, that would be good. <laughs> because that's exactly what he was doing. Uh, and there's the votes coming up. So uh, already there's, uh, uh, Nick's got some ground to make up. So, uh, but it's pretty, actually that's the closest start we've had to any of the debates. So you've got a, uh, an even chance, Nick. So I'd encourage you to, again, for those who haven't yet found, we've had 14 submissions, for those who haven't yet found the app to do so and to cast their vote. And while you're doing so, I'm going to introduce both of our speakers and I'll do so at the beginning. Both of our speakers are kind enough to agree to tackle this challenge. Uh, on my right, your left, is, is Leslie Rushton. Leslie is a reader in occupational epidemiology at the School of Public Health at Imperial College London. And she'll be uh, debating the pro argument that cancer societies must invest more resources to reduce environmental and occupational cancer risk exposure. To my left and your right is, is Nick Grant. Nick is an executive, the Executive Director of Strategy and Research Funding at Cancer Research UK and a newly elected member of the UICC board. Uh, and Nick will be arguing the anti-position. Firstly, I will confess conflict of interest is an important consideration. I will confess my conflict of interest. One of my roles at the Cancer Council Australia is Chair of the Occupational and Environmental Cancer Committee. You might guess which way my pre-vote will go. <laughs> So with that as an introduction, and I, if I can encourage, now we've got 19 votes, and Nick, you've got some ground to make up, son, good luck. Um, I will introduce our first speaker, and if I can hand over attention to Professor Leslie Rushton. Thank you very much. Um, I have an alternative title to this, which is occupation and environment are of primary interest and importance in the global picture of the causes of cancer. And I'm going to give you some uh, background to why I think that and why I think cancer societies should be more involved in investigating and um, helping us reduce these, um, what are preventable um, causes of cancer. So what are we talking about in terms of the problems? Let's have a look at the environmental causes first. So here's a lovely picture of one of the fabulous buildings in Beijing in the Forbidden City. But it's unusual, and it's unusual because of the blue sky. I was lucky I was there on holiday in September, and when we went round, we had this perfect day. 
So the main environmental hazard that day, especially to someone of my colouring, was UV radiation. And we know that UV radiation causes a huge number of non-melanoma and melanoma skin cancers worldwide, both in the general leisure and environment and to the workforce. Normally, um, normally, but an awful lot of days every year in Beijing, we're actually having a real problem seeing um, things because of the um, air pollution, the mistiness, the fogginess and the smog caused by air pollution um, in terms of uh, industry, but mostly in Beijing um, due to the traffic. So this is um, some of the things that we're worried about with traffic pollution, particulates, diesel fumes and hydrocarbons and many carcinogens in that mixture. Here's another pretty picture. This is a famous street in London and I'm going to come back to this. This is um, only two and a half hours away on the Eurostar, um, which you might be thinking about um, uh, doing a day trip there. But the interesting thing about this a road, Oxford Street, is that all the vehicles are diesel engines. The taxis and the um, buses, those that have not come hybrid or uh, partly electric, are all diesel. So it's an interesting experiment, and I'll give you some of the results of some experiments that have been done at Imperial College and King's College um, about the problems of being exposed, just walking up and down doing your shopping in Oxford Street. Not that I want to put you off. One of the major problems we have in the world is having fresh water, uncontaminated water. This is a, a, a tube well. Thousands and thousands of these have been dug in uh, Bangladesh to give pure water. But unfortunately, we have an environmental disaster here with naturally occurring arsenic. Arsenic is a class 1 IR carcinogen. It causes several skin cancers, uh, cancers, including skin, bladder, kidney, and a lot of non-malignant effects. So that's just an example of where we ourselves have caused an environmental, another example of an environmental issue. There are lots of others, just a few examples. Indoor air is as important in terms of cancer as outdoor air. This is a, a typical fuel burning um, of a cooking um, and um, uh, boiling water and so on in many countries where the indoor air um, is uh, full of uh, contaminants including carcinogens. There's a huge concern about electric, electric magnetic fields. These are power lines, but also mobile um, phones. And we have a major problem worldwide in terms of sanitation and waste management, whether it's a big dump like this, whether it's landfill, whether it's an incinerator. And there are a large number of uh, potential carcinogen exposures from these in straight into the environment. How much environmentally caused cancer is there? Well, we don't have very many um, global figures. These are just some from the uh, recently published in the Lancet, the 2015 Global Burden of Disease Estimates. These are deaths. Just to put it in um, context, um, the unsafe water and sanitation, which does not include the arsenic contamination, um, we're talking about um, 1 million, uh, uh, 766,000 um, causes of de uh, cause, uh, deaths caused by that. And air pollution, though, putting that in perspective, causes six times as much. And you can see that it's a mixture of ambient air pollution and the household air pollution, and a large number of these, thousands and thousands, every year we're talking about, are lung cancers due to an environmental issue. One thing I haven't mentioned is residential radon. A lot of carcinogens are actually not natural, so they're in our environment. Radon is naturally occurring and causes a large number of lung cancers worldwide. So that's just a flavor of some of the environmental issues. What about occupation? I guess everybody in this room is a worker. We're all workers. Going to a conference, although it's fun in Paris, is work. And we don't expect to go to work to, get an, um, to be injured, to have an accident, or to get a disease. And we certainly don't expect to end up with a cancer. 
The, I'm indebted to uh, Yuka uh, Takala, who's the current president of the International Congress for Occupation Health, for these international labor organization recent um, uh, figures that 2.3 million workers worldwide die every year from occupational accidents and diseases, and they estimate of these that are 666,000 deaths occur from exposure to carcinogens in the workplace. So it's a major issue. And it, this graph is from the same data, just putting these in context. Um, uh, you can see that about a third of all of these um, diseases are caused by cancer, uh, with cardiovascular disease being slightly higher. So what are the, are the carcinogens that we're talking about? This is the British study, which has estimated the burden of cancer due to occupational carcinogens, just to give you a flavor of them. I don't know whether you can read the causes down the bottom, but asbestos exposure, and I'm going to come back to this in a minute, is the biggest. Um, we have things like mineral oils, silica, diesel engine exhaust again. So diesel engine exhaust in the workplace is a major issue. Um, we have uh, work as a painter, um, silica, and so on. And notice that in the um, uh, Britain and also worldwide, we're busy building, and it's the construction industry in particular that are exposed to a large number of the IR Group 1 and 2A carcinogens. Notice that um, environmental tobacco smoke, ETS, is small in Britain. That's because we've banned it. But environmental tobacco smoke in the workplace is a major, major health issue in globally and um, comes out being one of the top ones if we look at them globally. There are very good social and economic re reasons to drive down both environmental and occupational cancer. There's the social cost to employees, their families, and to society. So not only have, is the employer e um, going to potentially experience a loss of life, we estimate that on average, uh, about 10, you lose about 10 years of your life. That's equivalent to smoking um, if you get an occupationally caused carcinogen. It costs us lots of money, health and medical care. Um, it's a loss of earnings, of course, and as uh, Terry has said, we're going to all have to work um, longer, so if we get a cancer whilst we're in work, um, how are we going to get this cancer patient back in and working? So it has a huge impact on the family. But it makes business, a good business sense, not to have this problem, because you don't have insurance increases, you don't have this problem of replacing valued staff, retraining, and so on. There's recently been a, a published report on the Health and Safety Executive website that have costed our British figures, and we're, it, this is just for Britain, £12.5 billion pounds annually that's costing um, uh, 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 these deaths and newly occurring cancers due to the workplace in Britain. And most of that in Britain is... Uh, do, being born by the employee, not the employer, and that's because with things like occupational and environmental cancers, especially occupation, these occur after the person has retired. Um, and so the employer um, in these particular figures is not actually um, having to, um, not obviously having to bear the cost of remediation. So why should cancer societies invest more resources to reduce these cancers? Well, first of all, there's an unbalanced knowledge base. This is just an example of breast cancer, but um, it, it occurs in many other cancers as well. So I, the blue is a bit difficult to read, but the blue is the family genetic things we know, are the, are the factors that are associated with increased breast cancer. We know a lot about lifestyle, and we've heard a lot at this conference about alcohol, about obesity, about lack of physical activity. We also know a, a lot about the hormonal and personal um, uh, characteristics of the women that get breast cancer. And uh, thankfully, the charities and other organizations have put a lot of money into studies investigating this and also to the um, treatment of breast cancer, which is one of the ones where we're having a success at survival. But we don't know very much, and we're very uncertain, about a lot of the environmental factors. 
The latest hot potato, if you like, is shift work, which is night work, disruption of the circadian rhythm, but really uncertain as to whether this is um, a major cause or and which is the shift patterns that we should be avoiding. And prostate cancer is also one of these where we're starting to get studies. But we need, it's really unbalanced in terms minutes, of the funding. Leslie. Okay, just finish then. So, they, cancer charities have an important role in increasing their funding because these studies have an important role in identifying and quantifying risks. If you ask the people involved in the IARP monographs, many of the epidemiological studies they look at are occupational ones. And that's because they um, uh, are used a lot in health impact assessment. You can use them for setting standards and workplace limits. Compensation, some occupational cancers are compensated for. They're very useful to draw out health inequalities, and they also allow you to look at the risk in non-malignant diseases, and I'll come on to that in the next slide. This is a, a hackneyed phrase, prevention is better than score, but I, cure, but I would say occupational and environmental um, issues are preventable. So if we take our modern problem, diesel engine exhaust, we know they call can cancers, but they also cause non-malignant effects, including chronic bronchitis. And the Oxford Street uh, work that's been done is to take people up and down Oxford Street for a couple of hours, measuring their lung function as they go along, and measuring the particulates and the diesel engine exhaust, and then as a control to send them round at another day round the serpentine in Hyde Park where we don't have the diesel. And I can tell you that for the people they sent down with mild chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, their lung function declined and stayed declined for over 24 hours were walking up and down Oxford Street, and I'm sure it wasn't the shopping that caused it. Continuing problems, asbestos. Let me just mention asbestos. This graph shows the countries where asbestos is continued, continuing to be actively used. This is giving us a long legacy in the future to future generations of the cancers involved with asbestos. So from the cancer societies, we need more knowledge base we need exposure data. We need to know in the lower middle income countries um, how much exposure is there. We need people to carry out research there. Many governments will not believe asbestos is a problem until a study has been done, out, done in their own study. Um, and we also need multi-center and country primary intervention studies, just as you fund uh, RCTs for drugs, we need RCT technology in prevention studies, particularly those which are transferable. The other thing I think cancer societies can do is, like you do with awareness campaigns in other things like obesity and so on, increase awareness of the public and workers of the risks of cancer for occupational and, and environment. Help us foster the partnerships we need, and this is where we do have to work with industry and employers and regulators to develop prevention strategies and transfer this knowledge and support our campaigns. I need you to wind up, Leslie. Yeah, last one. So I'm asking you to vote for the motion to prevent cancers caused by occupation and environment, both now and particularly for our future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. That was 14 minutes. Nick, you get about three minutes for your bit, is that That's right? That's fine. <laughs> so, <laughs> So I'll hand you over to Nick Grant, who's going to put the anti-argument. Thanks, Nick. Thank you, Terry, and good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for staying through to the end of the um, conference. And thank you for, to Leslie for so clearly articulating some of the issues around occupational and environmental risk. Um, I've got two declarations to make um, before I start. The first is my own conflict of interest. This is how I commute to work in the mornings. Um, so. In fact, I cycle down this exact road, so this is uh, an issue that is um, close to my heart and, and maybe even close to my lungs in some cases. You've got a fancier bike. <laughs> I do have a slightly fancier <laughs> bike. Um, fortunately, I do take a slightly more safety-conscious approach than, than these two gentlemen. Um, but as I say, I do experience um, diesel fumes personally um, almost every day. The second declaration is, is that I'm not an epidemiologist, um, and nor am I 
an expert on um, cancer risk, I've spent most of my career working in strategy. Um, and strategy, by definition, is about allocation of resources and making choices. Um, so I'm going to talk this afternoon about how, as cancer societies, we should be making resource allocation decisions, why focus is so important, and why I think our focus needs to remain, and maybe even increase, on other areas uh, of risk and not in occupational and environmental risk. Now, resource allocation and, and strategy setting in cancer societies is not easy. Uh, cancer is a highly complex disease. There are a myriad of different causes, many of them interdependent. The biology of the disease itself is almost infinitely complex. And, of course, there are many different stakeholders and organizations involved in the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of the disease. And as cancer societies, as much as we would like to, we can't do everything, and we certainly can't do everything well, and so this issue of focus becomes critically important. Do we focus more resources on research or on advocacy, on prevention, treatment, patient support, direct aid, and then within prevention, how do we prioritize between the many, as Leslie's already talked about, the many different attributable risk factors? Um, focusing means doing more of one or more things at the expense of another, and so ultimately it's about saying no. If we want to be expending more resources in environmental and occupational risk factors, we need to be doing less of something else. And of course, you know, Leslie made the case very well for investing in, in some of the issues that she talked about, and in the absence of other things for us to do, I would absolutely agree with her. Um, but I believe that as cancer societies, we are already often guilty of trying to do too much, and that we could have much more impact if we focus more resource on, on fewer priorities. I know many of you uh, in the room um, will hear the phrase regularly in your workplaces, we're just trying to do too much, and you'll leave this meeting with your head swimming with different issues and a long to-do list of, of things to do. Now, when we think about um, prevention specifically and about where we focus our efforts, we, we do need to take a, a nuanced and non-simplistic approach. As a global community, and, and Leslie's already alluded to this, we do need to make sure that we maintain a broad um, portfolio of research whereby we can monitor existing and potentially identify new potential um, risks and, and robustly quantify the scale the impact and the trajectory. Um, and many of us as cancer societies already contribute to this uh, base of evidence, as do many other research funders and, of course, other agencies such as IARC. Uh, we do clearly have a role as cancer societies in monitoring the evidence base across a broad range of risk factors, and we've got a role in sharing that information transparently uh, with the public and other stakeholders. But when we think about areas where we want to be more active from an advocacy point of view and how we might generate the evidence that allows us to um, implement those, um, the policy interventions that will have an impact, there is a huge benefit to focus, uh, particularly when you're trying to influence con controversial or complex issues where there is a strong opposition lobby. Over recent days, we've heard repeatedly um, of the challenges of overcoming some of the hurdles and barriers that are put in our way by the tobacco industry and increasingly from members of um, other sectors. Um, making progress requires creativity, sustained effort, evidence, and sustained effort, and advocacy efforts across a wide range of stakeholders. And focus is the key to um, enabling this, allowing you to cut through to provide clarity for your staff, for your partners, and to build long-term credibility. And ultimately, it allows you to have impact faster. One of the things I, I learned during this week was, was around some of the history of um, plain packaging of tobacco. Um, this is a concept was first mooted in the light, late 1980s, and yet it took until 2011 for the first implementation in Australia. These are really tough fights with powerful and deep-pocketed um, opponents. Now, every cancer society um, will need to look at priorities differently in their, in their local context, and, and Leslie's talked about some of the different countries around the world and some of the issues that might differ. In the UK, we, we sort of systematically look at both the potential impact that um, 
um, potential um, interventions could have in different um, areas and against different risk factors and the likelihood of um, achieving them. But really the biggest factor um, that drives our prioritization on the sort of x-axis of that graph, if you like, is the scale of the burden. Um, Leslie's already shared some of this data, which is looking at um, the uh, attributable cancer cases in the UK from various risk, risk factors. Um, and you can see the difference immediately in the scale of the burden between issues like tobacco on the left-hand side, um, excess weight and, and the interrelated issues around dietary factors, alcohol and UV, um, and some of the individual uh, environmental and occupational um, risk factors, which collectively confer a lot of risk, but individually are, are relatively small. And clearly, each one of those comes with its own challenges to tackle. Now, of course, that's the UK picture. Um, and as I say, every cancer society will have a different take depending on their local um, context. Um, but at a global level, again, none of the environmental or occupational risk factors really comes close to the estimated 1.6 million tobacco-related cancer deaths 300 million cancer deaths related to alcohol and half a billion cancer cases related to obesity and overweight. The other important dimension is clearly the role that other organizations can take in leading efforts at addressing environmental and occupational risk factors. Heart and lung disease charities, government public health agencies, environmental agencies, and health and safety bodies are all major players. And there are many instances when, as a cancer society, we can allow those organizations to take the lead and, and provide support without needing to commit significant resource ourselves. At a tobacco control meeting earlier in the week, um, Annalise from the Norwegian Cancer Society talked about how we've been doing tobacco control for so long now that we sometimes forget that it's still the most important thing. In the UK, there are over 100,000 deaths from tobacco smoking every year, of which 43,000 are from cancer. In the last 15 years, thanks to sustained advocacy, creating campaigning, creative campaigning, successful partnerships, and a really strong portfolio of evidence, we've been successful in reducing that um, tobacco prevalence rate by about 10%. And every 1% that we succeed in bringing that figure down prevents up to 2,000 cancer cases in the UK every year. It's a huge impact, but there is still so much to do. And globally, of course, the, cancer, the, the tobacco epidemic continues to gain, gain pace. And as, as we restrict the activities of tobacco, the tobacco industry in high-income countries, it redoubles its effort in low- and middle-income countries. And by 2030, more than 80% of the world's tobacco-related deaths will take place in low- and middle-income countries. This has to remain the most important global priority in prevention. In the last few years in the UK, we've also started to strategically prioritize work in obesity. 60% of adults in the UK are overweight or obese, and shockingly among children between two and 15 years old, 30% are overweight or obese. And because those rates have increased and continue to increase over the next 20 years, there will be uh, almost 700,000 new cases of cancer linked to excess weight. Um, and as I mentioned already, on a global basis, um, it accounts for around 500 million cancer cases worldwide. Um, we've invested in policy research, consortium building, public campaigning, advocacy, but we know this is going to take sustained effort and focus over many years to have the impact that we want and need to. So none of this means that we shouldn't be doing anything in occupational and environmental risk. And in the UK, we maintain a broad portfolio of some of the epidemiology research, long-term cohort studies that Leslie's already talked about. We provide evidence-based information and statistics um, to the public and other stakeholders, uh, in particular trying to be clear about the facts um, against some of the myths that, that Terry had perhaps alluded to at the beginning. And we will engage in occasional advocacy work, particularly, as I said, working with other agencies who are leading. But it would be difficult to justify uh, doing more given the scale of the other risk factors, and I'm sure it would jeopardize the progress that we can make in other areas. Thank you. Beautiful. So, perfect timing. So, to summarize, um, as cancer societies, we have a responsibility to our donors and to our beneficiaries to maximize the impact of the resources that we uh, expend. 
This means we need to be really focused in prioritizing the areas with the greatest opportunity. This will vary in different countries, but on a global basis, tobacco and increasingly obesity are our most important prevention priorities to address. We can all aspire to making a bigger, faster impact and focus on those areas is the way that we will get there. Thank you. I think your sister's in the audience, Nick. Well done. <laughs> Got about um, five. <laughs> Um, now, folks, it's turning the audience over to you, turn the microphone over to you. So this is an opportunity for you to offer your own perspective on this particular issue, uh, whether it's a comment or a specific question to our speakers. Uh, and I warn you, I'm in the habit of doing these questions myself unless you do it. So if I ask questions, that's on your head. Over here, thank you for starting. Thank you. Well, I'd like to share uh, my experience as a social scientist in Argentina. I work in the countryside, and people, local communities, are making their own surveillance. I'm sorry if I get touched, but for me, they, they aren't numbers, but people, and I remember their faces. And for example, the plaguicides down near soy plaguicides, or a town near uh, liquid refrigerants of the transformers, or even arsenic in the water, but especially with plaguicides and the PCB in the Spanish, I don't know in English. And they started with local tools. For example, the list of Nahuel. Nahuel that was a, a, a boy with le leukemia. And all the, the mothers after the church, they, they do like a map of the town and the, the amounts, the rising of the kids with leukemia in the last five years. And they, they, they need the support of the cancer society. It's not a big investment. It doesn't matter if it's still, it hasn't been completely proved, but they are fighting alone. They need at least uh, data registries well done in order to, to check in 10 years what happened because they are, the fight, they are um, very alone in the local communities in the countryside. Thank you. Any other commentary or questions? You're all very tired. What I'm gonna do is get everybody to stand up and stretch. I want you to stand up and stretch, take a big deep breath, stick your arms in the air, especially you, Sancho, you lead us as the president-elect. Don't run away, don't use this as a chance, Todd Harper, to get out of the room. Stretch your legs, stretch your arms, get a bit of oxygen in the system and we'll wake up a little bit. I'm gonna ride you for 20 more minutes and keep you awake. So that's all I'm asking for you to do. So we're all got a bit more oxygen running around the system, stretching a little bit. For those who wish to stay standing, feel free. And those who wish to come to the microphone and offer a perspective to this discussion, I encourage you so to do. Thank you, Sanji. You have a microphone in front of you and never turned one down yet. <laughs> So um, at the risk of um, incurring the wrath of my um, chair of the Occupational Environmental Cancers <laughs> Group, okay. um, I, I'm pretty sympathetic to Nick's argument around um, the idea that we can't do everything. I guess I'm, the question I have, or the um, whether it's resources or whether it's talents, because I'm wondering whether one of the things we should be doing is really putting advocacy pressure on some of the industries and other groups as opposed, because I think there's some parallels in this for me in who takes the lead on things like obesity and sugary drinks when in fact it's not just a cancer issue. Um, but um, I think in this one, there's a set of, um, at least in the occupational cancer space, a group of industries who know the evidence um, and choose not to protect their workers. And I would suspect that maybe we could perhaps think about how we do it in an advocacy um, perspective rather than necessarily investing large amounts of money. Um, anyway, spell I do, if I may, is ask a question of the audience. Who here works in a cancer organisation where anybody puts time or effort or resources into this question? Anybody raise their hand? Excellent. No, you don't, you count me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk to you about budgets later. Um, so there was a group over in this corner. Could someone like to tell me a little bit about the work that's been, and it's about halfway up and on my left, your right. They're pointing at each other. I love this bit. Thank you. <laughs>
in partnership against cancer. Um, I saw four hands from my colleagues in total, so I think maybe we account for 50% of what you saw. Um, so uh, we do a number of activities uh, related to occupational and environmental exposure. Um, at a system level, we're funding an organization called CAREX, which is uh, effectively a registry of uh, environmental and occupational uh, toxins and uh, levels. Uh, you can look at a map of Canada and see exactly what levels are in, in what parts of the country. Um, we also uh, translate some of that into programmatic work. So, for example, we have a prevention program called Coalitions Linking Action and Science for Prevention. And through that program, we have a number of initiatives. One is called Sun at Work, which is exactly a, what it sounds like. It's about UV exposure. Uh, it's targeted at men uh, working in professions where they're likely to have high levels of it. So those are just two examples of, of some of the work that we at the partnership either do directly or, or support. Uh, any, okay, okay, so. And uh, if people are interested in learning more, I encourage them to go to our uh, website. We've also got a booth that was being packed up, but <laughs> if you scamper, you can come and get some no, more information. stop the packing. So we've got a brochure on CAREX there. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that. And uh, I'm aware of a lot of good work in this space being done in Canada. Yeah, Leslie, go for it. Can I ask a question of the audience? Of all of you who uh, work with cancer patients or any patients, any of you being health, do you ever ask your patient, what do you do and what did you do if they're retired? Do you ever ask about their work? It's one or two hands. I would like occupation to be a key thing that people think about when they see a patient. What did that person do and, and, and where do they live? What sort of environment do they live in? Because we haven't really discussed this much in, 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 this, in, in the sessions I've been to, but we know that people who are deprived also are often environmentally deprived. They're living near higher trafficked roads and so on. And I, I think um, the clinicians at this conference could do a lot to, to um, understand some of these um, problems that the people that are coming to them with health problems um, have and what may be the causes. I also want to weigh into this discussion. I guess one of my observations in this space since I've taken an interest in it is that it very quickly can fall into the realm of industrial relations. It can be in the environment of unions and workers versus employers. Uh, and in that contested, combative industrial relations space, sometimes the actual genuine health effects, whether they're there or not, tend to get lost in that battle between capital and labour, if you want to contextualise it in that way. And what I've observed is what little time we've put into this space coming from a cancer society just to talk about the focus on cancer has been very helpful and constructive for both sides because we are in a position from what little effort we invest to be seen as an honest broker with a focus on the cancer outcome rather than being caught up with an industrial relations type conflict. And that's been commented to me by a variety of people that that's something that we can uniquely bring to the table with regard to this kind of um, discussion. And the other observation I make is that a large proportion of the community have a genuine belief of some contribution to cancer coming from an environmental or an occupational cause. In some cases that may be completely without support or evidence, it's a belief. In other cases there may be some reasonable evidence to justify that belief. But it's very hard for the people, even in the richest countries in the world, and that's I'm fortunate to come from one, to unpick that is an enormously challenging thing. And my observation is that that's something that we can help. And the other observation that comes with that is that means that occasionally we can then turn direction and a focus on those things where we do have sound evidence, whether it's tobacco or obesity or alcohol or whatever else. So there is, and I've observed a lot of mythology in this space, where people think that whatever it might be is contributing to their cancer in the absence of any evidence of that being the case. 
So being able to play that myth-busting honest broker role can sometimes allow us to focus on the things where we do have the sound evidence. Harpo, you've come to the microphone to stop me talking, and I thank you for doing so. Well, you're in the spirit of making observations, so I thought I would make some observations Good. as well. So um, I have three observations. One, um, that, as usual, this debate isn't really about a yes or no. It, you know, we, we all know that we need to do more in lots of areas, and, and, and of course, if money were no object, yes, of course, we should do a lot more in this area. And as environmental and occupational risk exposures become more understood, then clearly different organisations will do more as, 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 as that evidence base emerges. And I'll come back to evidence on, in a second. The second observation I would make, um, just in response to Sanchia's point, particularly on the um, question of obesity, is that what we have found in the UK is that a lot of the focus on obesity and overweight historically has talked about the impact on diabetes and to a lesser extent on cardiovascular disease. And what we have found from the work that we've done is that that isn't sufficient to motivate behavior change. When people understand that there's also a cancer risk, then it becomes a much stronger motivator of change. And, and actually that's become a really important point that we've made to the government in terms of actually getting the government to focus on obesity as a risk factor. Of course, it's poorly understood yet amongst the public that it is a risk factor. The third observation I would make is just the importance of really good evidence. And with some of the things that we've already talked about this afternoon, the evidence is not yet strong enough. And we need to be really, really careful that the evidence is strong enough. And we've had a great example in the UK where um, we had clusters of uh, higher levels of childhood leukemia around radiation plants, radiation, um, uh, ra what am I trying to say? Nuclear. Power plants, um, uh, uh, nuclear power plants. And, and actually what has emerged over time uh, is that it was nothing to do with the fact that they were nuclear power plants. It's most probably due to um, infection clusters in those areas. But for years, for decades, people have assumed it was due to the um, radiation emerging from those plants. So I just think we have to be really, really careful because it's very easy to draw conclusions from what are not statistically robust uh, clusters of activity. And I think we, we, we just need to always keep the, the importance of strong evidence in our minds. Anyone else? We do have the final wrap-up of both of our um, debaters, and uh, unless anybody else wants to weigh in, I'll invite them to have their final say uh, and in three minutes. Uh, Nick, would you like to kick off on summarising your points? Anything you want to add? Mm, thank you. Well, I think, I mean, thank you to everybody for the, uh, the interesting ideas, um, insights and, and points that have, have added to the, to the debate. Um, I certainly, you know, take, take the point that... Um, when we look at the numbers, we need to re remember that um, these are people, not just um, and, and not just numbers. Um, but I would certainly reiterate my point that, as uh, organisations, as a community, we're taking on a really huge and uh, complex challenge, and we've got limited resource um, with which to do that. Um, I think you know over the coming years, the epidemiology will shift. Um, the evidence base will grow, and I think it's quite possible that our focus uh, as individual organisations and as a community will, will shift with that. Um, but in the short term, um, I've already talked about the importance of tobacco and obesity. I believe that we need to continue to retain the focus in those areas um, and continue to build focus, strive for impact, and do what we believe is best for the interests of current and future generations. Thank you. I actually would argue with the last speaker and that we have good, robust data on occupation and environmental risk factors. I would also argue for equity. One shouldn't be exposed to carcinogens at the workplace. One shouldn't be exposed to carcinogens. It shouldn't be acceptable. And uh, the other issue, which I haven't mentioned, but I will now, is that we are transferring these risks 
from the developed countries to the lower and middle income countries. Our multinationals are moving their industries over to the, the sort of countries I showed in the graph um, on asbestos. And the sort of exposures that of the few studies we've got um, of these carcinogens is showing the sort of exposures that we had in the 1950s in Europe and North America and Australasia. So we need to do something about this. We need um, countries and cancer societies to think about doing studies to show that this is actually happening. We need clinicians to think about occupation and environment when they treat their patients. If they see patients in these countries where they, are, um, uh, they can make a link with an industry, then it's important. And I'd like to pick up the advocacy point that was made. I think it's a really important role that the cancer societies could start to pay, play. Ca occupation and environmental causes of ill health have gone down the list in being the fashionable thing to investigate. But they're still causing, as I've shown, a large number of deaths and newly occurring cancers, which are preventable. We could do something about them. And I think the cancer societies have a really important role they could play with giving a lot more support to making sure that policies that go through, for example, there's a big issue going through at the moment of the um, changes to the carcinogen directive. There's a vote later on in November and the values that they've chosen have been done on cost-benefit so that the industries are not disproportionately disadvantaged. They will not save the number of lives that should be saved. The cancer society should be aware this is going on and help um, consider whether they should be um, advocating uh, a more important change. So I, I would hope that this debate has made some of the people out here, both clinicians and cancer societies, think more seriously about the issue of occupational and environmental cancers. And hopefully, next, in the next two years, next time, there will be some more sessions specifically on this issue at the World Cancer Congress. Thank you. Folks, I'm going to invite you to give both of our speakers a round of applause, uh, particularly... Thank you. Clearly you can hear the passion in Leslie's voice that's been her, uh, the focus of her Sorry. research career. Uh, and it's fabulous to have people like Leslie who do advise us. But I particularly want to thank Nick who kind of had his arm twisted behind his back a little bit to take on the Darth Vader role in this. Of course everybody wants to do more and it is an important issue. Uh, and so uh, it's great to have this level of discussion. It's important to have this kind of discussion because this debate is a real one. There is decisions made on a regular basis as budgets come around as to whether we do or do not invest in new areas. Uh, and so we really do have to, need to think carefully about how those finite resources are invested. Uh, and I think it's worth us giving serious thought to the issues that we, looking, we are looking to tackle and the extent to which we can be constructive about them. What I'm going to do before I invite you to go and enjoy the final closing ceremony for the conference is to grab your phones, grab your app, and cast your final vote in this particular the third of our great debate topics. Uh, and I will encourage you to do so now, and hopefully they'll come up on the screen. Nick's feverishly looking around. I think he's got about four phones over there he's going to vote on. He's actually pinched a bunch of phones. <laughs> This that can't be the first, second question, is it? That's a, this is, oh, this okay. is the second vote. The this second is a post okay. vote. Okay. Very interesting. I mean, clearly the, the numbers are modest, and if you did your um, statistical analysis, Leslie, I suspect that we might hit statistical significance on that sample size. <laughs> Who knows? Um, but, uh, a small sample. Clearly, cancer people are nice people and they want to do more good things for more people and that's entirely understandable. The tough decision is made in the executive room and in the boardroom about investment of resources. The discussion will continue. Folks, thank you very much for coming on. Please enjoy the rest of the Congress, the closing ceremony. I hope you get some time to enjoy Paris before you have to go home and thank you very much again for giving us an hour of your time. Thank you.